I'd like to start off by saying that I learned Sefer Shoftim, Lezecher Nishmas, Avimori, Horeni, Kaparis, Mishkovel, Shlomo Zalman, Ab Yisrael Abram Abba Ben, Shlomo Zalman, Walter Goldstein, and I dedicate these few words in his memory. There are three issues that I came across in learning Sefer Shoftim that really stood out in my mind. The first question was, what is a Shofet? And what do we mean exactly by the term Shofet? The second was the cyclical nature of the Sefer, in that we see a definitive cycle of sin, desperation, reproachment, teshuva, and victory. And the third, in tying these issues together, is the concept of Masa Avos Simon Labanim, that the deeds of our fathers are assigned to us of how to live. So that first issue, the name of Shoftim, what is a Shofet? The word itself is defined in English as a judge. In today's world, especially as an attorney, when I hear the word judge, the name, the title judge, I think about somebody sitting in a big courtroom or sitting in chambers, writing opinions, listening to arguments, and hearing cases. Here, a shofet is significantly more than a judge. A shofet in the Torah sense of the word is a leader. A shofet is a person who is of the utmost spiritual level to a point where he, can receive, he or she can receive nevuah. They lead the people. They answer all questions regarding halacha, as well as adjudicating disputes. By way of example, the first four shoftim listed are Asniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. Between these three, their reigns, their tenures as shoftim lasted a mere 40 some odd years. But that brings us, that leads us up to one of the more famous shoftim, Devorah. And although her tenure was for 40 years, the more remarkable portion of her tenure was very early on. And Devorah provides us with an interesting contrast to what we would consider a modern day judge. Like a modern day judge, Devorah sat in one particular dis place and dispensed her wisdom and tried cases. The Navi tells us in introducing Devorah in Perak Dalid, Pasuk He, Vihi Yosheves Tachas Tamar, Devorah, Bein Harama Uvein Beisel, Bahar Ephraim, Vayalu Eleha Bene Yisrael Lamishpat. That she, Devorah, sat under a particular date tree that was in between the cities of Ramah and Basel that were in the mountains of Ephraim, and that all the people came to her, all of Bnei Yisrael came to her for, to hear her wisdom. Moreover, the Gemara in Megillah, Daf Yud Dalet Amid Aleph, explains that Devorah would sit under this particular tree in this particular place because it was out in the open, and therefore there would never be any question that she would be seen, in a, be seen going into a room with a man by herself. This is a testament to her piety. Thusly, the Navi is teaching us that this group of people, this bridge of leadership, of the leadership gap between Yehoshua and Shmuel, who is introduced in the next Sefer, are exceptional people whose acts go well beyond those that we would attribute to a mere judge in the modern sense. They were the spiritual leaders of their generations, counted on and relied upon to lift up the people in times of strife and spiritual lacking. And then started thinking about the second point, the second issue in Sefer Shoftim, and that's the structure, this cycle. Let's take a look at some of the background of the Sefer for just a moment. Shoftim covers a period of 356 years. This is in very stark contrast to the book immediately prior, Yehoshua, which lasted 14 years. And it is, in fact, again, contrasted with Shmuel, which was Shmuel Aleph and Shmuel Bet. Shmuel himself lived, the Mepharshim say, for approximately 52 years. 
However, the events of his life covered a significant amount of ground in text than these shoftim over a 356-year period of time. Finally, the author of Sefer Shoftim was Shmuel. And in a sense, he's writing, his writing is a bridge that bridges the gap in an historical sense as well as a leadership sense between Yehoshua and himself. And by the way, Shmuel was in fact as well the author of Sefer Yehoshua. We leave off, he leaves us off at the end of Yehoshua with the division of Eretz Yisrael between the twelve Shvatim. And he picks us up in his, in his Sefer with the introduction of him and his story. In that 356 period of, year period of time, B'nai Yisrael were so devoted that we have only relatively few instances where the Navi wishes to remark as to the events of the time period. And then in terms of the structure, Shmuel foreshadows for us in Perak Bays and ending within the first few psukim of Perak Gimel, foreshadows for us exactly this cycle. That cycle being that B'nai Yisrael are dedicated to Hashem. And then after lengthy periods of time, B'nai Yisrael stray, and his particular emphasis put on worshiping idols, which is an entirely different lecture. Hashem would then punish B'nai Yisrael by allowing any one of their regional rivals, or, for example, in the case of Shimshon, at one point, seven of the regional rivals joining rank, to oppress B'nai Yisrael. Then, as B'nai Yisrael has charata, Hashem chastises them and reminds them that Hashem is the one that took us out of Mitzrayim and brought us to Eretz Yisrael. And then the shofate of the time rises up and leads the charge against the oppressor and with the help of Hashem, defeats those oppressors. Putting together these two concepts of the righteousness of a shofate and the cycle of sin and redemption, Shmuel gives us a very profound example, again in Perak Dalid, of Devorah. Devorah was so moved by the miraculous defeat by Hashem through her and her husband Barak of the Canaanite general Sisera and his king Yavin that she sang the famous Shiras Devorah, which we say as the Haftorah on Shabbos Shira, wherein she recounts the victory and rejoices in the fact that B'nai Yisrael banded together to accomplish this amazing feat. After her victory, though, and after her death, the cycle then continues. As Shmuel moves through the various Shoftim, Gidon, Avimelech, Tola, Yair, Yiftach, Ibsan, Elon, Abda, we see that B'nai Yisrael repeat the cycle over and over again. They sin and worship idols. Hashem punishes them by having an enemy oppress them. Then the Shofate musters up a small army and defeats the enemy by way of divine intervention. The one Shofate who we cannot fail to mention in any discussion of Sefer Shoftim is Shimshon. His actions stand out to me, at least, much more than the others. Shimshon reminds me of a modern-day vigilante. Not only is he successful in using the strength that Hashem has given him to defeat his enemies, he pretty much does it by himself. Rather than stay in one locale as Devorah under her palm tree did and dispense wisdom and judgment, Shimshon roams the land. In fact, Shimshon was from Shevet Dun, who inherited the land from what we would say today is approximately Ashdod in the south, up the modern-day coastline, to just south of Haifa. Yet his downfall occurs further south from there in Aza, which was part of the inheritance of Yehuda, and at the time was inhabited by Plishtim. 
In the famous telling of Shimshon's story, it appears that he was hiding in plain sight at the time of his downfall from his biggest enemy and threat, the Plishtim. Shimshon, like Devorah, is the quintessential example of what we began this discussion with. That is, Shimshon as a shofate is held to a very high standard. And unlike his predecessor, Devorah, Shimshon fails to live up to this high standard and pays the ultimate price by, giving, by losing his life. The part of the story, of course, that we are not told as children that encapsulates this is how when Shimshon was initially captured by the Plishtim, the Plishtim gouged out Shimshon's eyes. The Gemara in Sota Daf Tes Amud Beis says that this was punishment for him looking at Plishti women. And in fact, the Navi tells us he married two Plishti women, including the Leela, who was his downfall. Clearly the one failure, if you can call it that, of Shimshon's life was his inability to live up to these reasonable standards to which we hold our leaders to. So now what do we learn from all of this? And what about that third point of Masa of Osim and Lebanon? We know that Tanakh in general is not merely meant to be a history book. There is some deeper meaning, and there has to be some deeper meaning in everything. My opinion is that here's where we see a great example of Masa of Osim and Lebanon, that the deeds of our fathers, our instructions, our guidance to us of exactly how to behave. More specifically, we go back to this cyclical nature of the entire Sefer. In times when we forsake Hashem, Hashem in turn forsakes us. Whereas when we are devoted to Hashem and the pursuit of Torah learning, and as importantly Torah living, Hashem will provide us with what He provided B'nai Yisrael during that 356 year period depicted in Sefer Shoftim, which is long and peaceful and meaningful life.